Welcome to this video series about improvising by Sietse de Vries. You can support this video series by donating the amount of your choice to Sietse de Vries's Patreon account, which can be found by searching Sietse de Vries Patreon or by finding the link in the description below the video. Enjoy the video. Let's do a lesson on this wonderful chamber organ. It's from the 1830s, built by James Bruce. And it came from Scotland, from Mythlodion, or Mythlothian, and I probably pronounce it terribly because, well, Scottish is not a language that I can understand or speak at all. All right, let's start with a little story. Um, imagine a small child, let's say a girl, eight years old, and she discovered that some of her friends can play a very nice tune on any keyboard instrument. And it goes like this, you probably know it. In the Netherlands, that's the first song that everyone wants to play on a keyboard. The interesting thing is here, imagine that girl goes to a piano teacher or organ teacher and says, I want to learn this piece. That's actually a problem, because normally a teacher would say, well, that's a piece in F sharp major, that's way too difficult. You need at least five years of piano lessons before you can play F sharp major. Which shows you actually the problem in uh, music education, we have the wrong approach because for a child it really doesn't matter if you play white keys, black keys, it's completely the same. It's all about the sound and having fun on the keyboard. Well, that to start off, uh, I want to summarize some of the things we've done so far on this little chamber organ. And uh, well, let's set the camera a little bit closer so that you can look at my fingers too. But before we do that, let's have a closer look at this beautiful organ. As you can see, it doesn't have pedals and you can actually uh, make sure that the whole thing closes down because it was made for a house, of course. So you can actually fold in the whole keyboard. And then we have the wonderful dummy pipes. Those are actually made out of wood, but gilded and then the wonderful neo-gothic ornamentation. This is the type of organ that's actually very hard to find a new home for because it's too large for a normal living room. And of course, a lot of organists are not interested in an organ without pedals and with only one manual. But as you can see and hear, it's really a beautiful instrument. Well, so far we have worked on harmonizing a hymn. Let's take another hymn. Um, a famous German hymn is Christus, der ist mein Leben. And it's a beautiful melody, so I will show it to you and you can try to harmonize the melody. As you know, that's step one. You really need to know a melody by heart and then you can harmonize it with one, four and five. I will play it in C major, so we need to try it of C of F and G. And if you want to make sure that you really know the melody and that you also know exactly what you're doing when you're harmonizing, play it in a different key. So let's play it in D major. That means D is now one and we need F sharp, of course, in the triad. Four is now G major and five is A major. And for that triad, you need the C sharp. So now we have this.
remember to avoid substitute fingering as much as possible. It's really about your brain already preparing the chord and then your fingers just move to the right note. And of course, when you have some sharps and flats, sometimes it's easier to move your fingers already a little bit, that's fine, but try to avoid it uh, in general, because a lot of people actually don't uh, control their fingers anymore. They just move all the time to play legato, and it's not that important. That's important when you play romantic music, of course. All right, let's see what we can already do to make some nice variations. Well, the easiest way to make a variation, that's what I showed in the last video, is just to have a fifth in the left hand and just move around the melody a little bit. And you can do that by making little ornaments or when there is a jump to the next note to fill in the gap between the two notes. So something like this. <laughs> This brings out your creativity because you don't have to worry about chords, you can really think about the melody and what you can do with it. And every person is different in creativity, so it's always nice to see what happens when you try something like this. And remember, it's not about doing difficult things. This can be a perfect, legitimate, nice variation in a larger partita, in, in a variation. Uh, that you make lots of variations on this hymn tune, this could be a perfect part of it. All right, let's do something more interesting and I will add the four foot principle again um, with the left hand because that's a more difficult way of making a variation. You still play the normal chords in the right hand, but now you decide to move the left hand a little bit more. So instead of only playing the bass notes, you start making little motifs on the bass note. So uh, what I showed on the regal last time you can use and you end up with a little variation like this. And like I said before, you can start simple by using the same motive all the time, then you can use broken triads all the time, and then you can combine things, and then you will discover that, again, creativity kicks in. So you can make nice uh, descending lines, for example, to make sure that the gap between two notes is exactly filled up by what you play. But that's up to you, that's always different, and of course you can copy what I do uh, at first and then see if you can come up with something of your own. And of course change rhythms all the time, you can also do it with a dotted rhythm, like this. And actually, I know that some of you are really bothered by the ugly parallel chords that I'm playing, and that's good actually, that means you have a good ear that parallels don't sound really beautiful, especially this combination of 4-5. Some people are so uh, much used to it because you hear it in pop music all the time, but it is indeed actually very ugly. So this could be the moment that you introduce a different triad, because what we did so far is using 1-4-5, meaning the root, the subdominant and the dominant, and those are the most important chords. But of course we also have a 2, a 3 and a 6. 
Of course, we do have a seven as well, but that's actually a different matter. Well, it's easy to show. Let's go back to C major. That means one is the triad of C major. Two is D minor. Because you always use the notes that belong to the key you're in. Then three is E minor. Four is F major. Five is G major. Six is A minor. And seven has a special sound. Because that's not a normal triad, that's a diminished triad. And it has a very special sound if I add another note to it. You get a really wonderful effect that we can definitely use later, because that's the kind of chord that you can use for any uh, interesting shift of keys. All right, but let's uh, go back. We already had one, four, five. Uh, we can use two, three, and six as well. And the interesting thing is here that if you think about A minor, which is actually the relative minor key of C major, that's how you call it. So we have C major, no sharps, no flats. A minor is the relative minor because it also doesn't have any sharps and flats, but instead of being major, it's a minor key. So the scale is, of course, now the interesting thing is when you start harmonizing in A minor, meaning A is, of course, 1, then D is 4, and E is 5, those are actually exactly the three triads that we miss out on, what we did so far, because, well, what is uh, 2 in uh, 3 and 6 in C major? is actually 1, 4, and 5 in A minor. Well, let's not go too deep into the theory part, but uh, as you go along you will see how easy it actually is. Uh, let's first try to play something in a minor key. So this hymn tune that we have now is perfectly suited to play in a minor key as well, as a little variation. So instead of C major we play the same melody, but now in A minor. And uh, it works like this. probably thinking, well, some of the chords sound a bit typical. Uh, for example, when you play the five, it sounds very profound in a way, but of course you can change it into and that's actually fully normal. When you play in a minor key, you can change the five into a major triad. So E minor turns into major. And we call this G-sharp a leading tone, leading note, because it leads to the root. And actually you can do something else, and that's probably what uh, a lot of you already learned in music theory. If you go up, you can also change the 4 into a F-sharp in a melody, so that the, uh, going up you have two sharps. And going down, you don't have any sharps at all. So you could also play the tune like this.
now it gets really interesting because now we start combining things because I'm still playing those ugly parallel chords. So now we can also start thinking about using the chords I was playing now. So that was A minor, D minor and E minor. And we introduce them into the key of C major. And keep in mind what we call three, two, three and six in C major is actually one, four and five again, but now in A minor, the relative minor key. So it's actually easier than you think. Most chords have the same type of feeling and uh, they also sound more or less the same as you will discover more and more. So let's go back to C major, but now I'm trying to avoid the ugly parallel four, five by replacing the five with another chord because this chord with the B on top. I can of course use a different chord now. I can also use E minor. And also when I have a C on top, I could already choose the C major chord. I could already choose the F major chord. Now I can choose the A minor chord. That means I can make a really beautiful harmonization like this. Keep in mind, this is actually a big step going from 145 in a major key to using all the different triads. So make sure when you teach something like this that you wait for the right moment. And that's different in every person. You have small children that really enjoy uh, doing difficult things and they can think uh, abstract about certain things already that they really understand the 145 system and the relative minor. But only when you feel that you're ready for it, you start using all the triads and uh, you can really stay with one, four, five for a long time. But what helps, of course, is if you try something in a minor key to help you uh, getting grip on the whole idea of the different triads that you can use. Well, for closures, let's have one more variation, a very easy one, actually. If you look at the pieces from uh, Pachelbel, for example, who wrote the famous canon in D, he also wrote some variations on hymn tunes. And sometimes it's almost ridiculously simple what he does. Um, he has this variation on the hymn tune Was Gott tut, das ist wohlgetan. You probably know the melody. And he would really write down a variation like this. And something like this is very easy to improvise, of course. What you do is actually breaking the triads down into uh, very virtuous uh, interesting sounds. If you want to do it in a very easy way, and let's go back to the hymn tune we had, Christus der ist mein Leben, you can start by using triplets, so you still play the same chords as what we did in the beginning, but now you use triplets. And if you want to have a more interesting sound, you can uh, turn it into four notes on every beat by using the left hand note, the bass note, as the last one. That means you play like this. And when you speed it up,
Or you can use the system that Pachelbel had, he just goes back and forward. So like this. So that means you already have quite a few options to make variations, so uh, make sure again you use different hymns, you use different keys, that you really practice the same stuff all the time, but in different ways. So don't stay too long in one key with one hymn tune, but keep your mind fresh and alert by using different melodies. Make sure you know the melodies by heart and have fun making small variations. Alright, that's it for today. Good luck with it.